Greetings. Thank you for tuning in to listen to Equipping the Bride podcast. I'm Brother Jason DeMars from Beaufort, South Carolina, a minister at Bethel Tabernacle. New episodes of this podcast are posted every Friday. You can watch this podcast on YouTube and listen to it on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. If you have any questions, testimonies, or prayer requests, please let me know at jasondemars.com. I also have free books and tracks available at my website, and shipping is free as well. May the Lord richly bless you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. So, with the message that the Lord laid on my heart this morning to preach, it would seem like we had a meeting this week and committees and we all talked about what songs should be sung and who should sing specials and what it should be and the, the song that I should come to the pulpit. But the, we didn't have to do that <laughs> because the Lord did it. Yeah. Amen. And, and you just see how he sovereignly works. It's amazing. The, the, you couldn't have, you literally couldn't, probably couldn't have planned it as well if you as a human would have planned it. So thank the Lord. Sisters that sang a special, you know the Holy Spirit's working on their hearts to bring them to that place. And I didn't even know what I was going to preach on. Actually, I thought I was preaching on something else when I got on the plane to come here. And the Lord changes things, and my goodness, so thankful for him. We're going to have church, amen? Amen. I want to speak on knowing him as life. I don't want to keep you standing up forever. But just want to greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, bring greetings to you from uh, Bethel Tabernacle in Beaufort, South Carolina, from my pastor, Brother Jason Watkins. Um, As you can tell, I do not have a southern accent. I'm originally from Minneapolis, Minnesota area. That's where I came to the message uh, back in 99 when I was about 20 years, 21 years old. And I've been doing missions work um, in the Middle East for about 14 years now specifically working with Iranians and Iranian refugees in Turkey and with the Farsi language translations and now more recently with Egyptians working on Arabic translations and now the Lord has expanded the work into uh, Israel working with some Jewish and Gentile believers living there and uh, so be, be in prayer for those believers facing trials and difficulties and bombs exploding over their head on a daily basis so pray for them. Um, in 2019, the Lord led my family to move from Minnesota to South Carolina, so we've been living there and doing our ministry out of the church there since then, so I'm very glad for the opportunity to be here and to meet your pastor, and just a wonderful time of fellowship we had last night, and just could tell we have a very uh, kindred spirit there, and uh, love of the word together, so I'm, I'm excited for the opportunity to Minister of the Word, I trust the Lord will take His gift and use it for your benefit, amen. for your encouragement, for your correction, for your building up. So, amen. Well, how many of you have ever been through a trial? Amen. How many of you have ever been through trial after trial amen. after trial? How many of you ever felt discouraged? Amen. How, many ever, how many of you have ever felt hurting, felt alone? Felt weak, felt, how can I keep going? (laughs) If you're not raising your hand, nod your head, show that you're alive. Amen. (laughs) Because if you're if you're a Christian, you're facing trials and the devil's striking against you. So strange title to to start with those questions. Knowing him is life. Let's turn in the scriptures. We're gonna look in John 17. And we'll read just the first three verses, and then um, once I'm done with that, you help me out, brother. Brothers in the booth, get the PowerPoint up. There we go. Thank you. Amen. So I have verse three there, but I'm going to read one, two, and three. These words spake Jesus, and lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son that thy Son also may glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, 
and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Let's pray. Father, we look to you, Lord. You're, you're the sovereign God that controls all things, Lord. You are sovereign over our hearts and minds. And we ask that your Holy Spirit would come, Lord, and speak to the hearts of your people. Give them a correction. Give them encouragement. Give them strength, Lord. May, the, may they see that your hand is on their lives. And may, may they not just uh, know it with the knowledge, but they, may they have a, a revelation, an experiential understanding and revelation of the word. Lord, not just out there, but the word for them and in them and through them, Lord. We ask that you would take control, Lord. We want to step out of the way that you would have the preeminence. We ask these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. So as we look at this verse, um, the, there's a, tra- a Wiest translation that I sometimes look, look at to get different layers of meaning. And in this one, when he translates this verse in his expanded translation, he says, this is life eternal, namely that they might be having an experiential knowledge of you, the only genuine God and of him whom you sent on a mission, Jesus Christ. So, it isn't about knowing God merely in an instant, in the instant you're saved. But it's about knowing God continually and growing in knowing Him continually on a daily basis. It's not about knowing Him from revival to revival, from camp to camp, from really... Uh, inspired service to really inspired service. We thank the Lord for those things. We love those things. We're blessed by those things. But your walk with him has to go far beyond just a great service. It's daily, in your daily living, that you have to know him. It's continually, day by day, growing and increasing in, in knowing him through life's ups and downs and trials and difficulties. It's not a passion that only lasts for special meetings. This special meeting's over. Now I'm excited for the next special meeting. When's the next one? And where can I go here? And where can I go here? No, that's good. We get an experience with the Lord. We can get it in our, in our bedroom on our knees. We can get it at the special meetings. We can get it at church. We can get it out in the woods. We can meet God anywhere. And we thank the Lord for special meetings. We thank the Lord for anointed meetings and prayer lines and altar calls. We thank the Lord for that. And we need that and we love that and we appreciate what God does through that. And yet, if, if our understanding is so shallow that that's all we need and that's all of our experience, we're going to be in trouble because life isn't every day uh, a camp. Amen. It isn't a youth meeting. It isn't family camp. It isn't an altar call. We need to learn how to experience an altar call every day when we get up in the morning and seek the Lord's face. I can, I can say for myself, many times you feel like you know God and you're walking on the mountaintop and you know him so well and the messages become reality to you and you're seeing it and it's increasing in your understanding. Then Sometimes the circumstances of life come and you wonder, do I know anything? Amen. Do I understand anything? I, I, I'm so confused about what is happening. I, I don't understand it. And you feel that weight of, I'm alone. What am I doing? Lord, I can't find you. Where are you? I'm extending my hand. Lord, help me. Where are you? And he says, I'm holding you. You're right in my hands. You're right in my arms. How are you missing this? Knowing him needs to be a a burning passion that follows you every day, every morning, and it births itself in a continual fellowship of knowing God more and more and deeper and deeper. This is life eternal. That can't be overemphasized. This is life eternal. What is life eternal? Going to church getting baptized, going to Bible study, devotions, sure. But what is all of this 
activities about that we're doing. Why, why do we do that? Why do we take communion? Why do we go to church? This gets to the heart of the matter. And we have a huge problem if we're going to church to be seen and to make sure we're in the right circles and the right place. And the, No, what we, our purpose is to know him. Amen. When you get up in the morning, what is your purpose? It should be to know him and be his channel in your world. You can know a lot about God, but you can know God very little. It's a very important distinction to make. Knowing God versus knowing about God. A person can know a lot about God without knowing God at all. A person can know a lot about godliness without knowing God personally at all. Just a a very little of knowing God personally is worth a lot more than a great deal of knowledge about God. I think these things are plain. Um, Brother Branham said, confirmation of the commission. He said, well, you just don't know your Bible. I said, well, that may be so, but I know the author real well. He said, that's it. You know, it doesn't say to know his book, but to know him is life. See, Satan knows his word, but to know him, the author of the word. See? Amen? Amen? In the works that I do, bear witness of me. Brother Branham says, so friends, find divine love and favor with God. Then God, if he finds favor with you, will give his gifts into you. But first, find the giver. Seek the giver. Then the gifts will come as God sees fit to give it to you. Do you believe that? These are critical things to remember in the hour that we're living in. Satan is trying to get us off track wherever, wherever he can. We can be looking at... Now, I just want to say, I'm preaching this sermon to myself. So if you all enjoy it, wonderful. But this is for me. There's so many things we can do in serving God, and we get off track and forget what is really the point. You want gifts. You want to see the supernatural. You want to see God moving. Why? What for? Why do you want that? Is it because you want to know him more? You want to experience him more? It's not just knowing facts about God. It's not knowing facts about the great God that dwells in heaven. It's knowing about the God that's living and moving in your life. But you've got to seek the giver first before you're looking after the gifts and the things that go along with it. Brother Branham says, when I made that remark a while ago about education, I wasn't trying to take crutches for my ignorance. But what I'm trying to say is that it doesn't take education to know God. It takes a submissive heart to know God. Ah, what a clue. It takes a heart that's willing to be corrected, willing to repent. That's the zeal of our age. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. To know God, we have to have that heart of flesh, not the heart of stone, willing to submit to him. He says, now Saul found out that his ecclesiastical vest didn't fit a man of God. It just don't work. You don't need to know theology. You need a little neology to know God. That's where you go and meet him. Lots of people, lots of religions, everybody prays somehow. Catholics pray. Anglicans pray. Everybody prays, but sometimes the prayer is simply repeating what they heard. And even we can do the same thing. We can repeat what we heard or we heard how this person prays. But this is not that kind of prayer. It's where you go and you get on your knees and you meet with him. You and him alone. Now, we may not be educated. We may not be highfalutin people and things like that. We may not be dignitaries. But we do know God. Amen. We know him because there's a Holy Spirit. See, and it compares with word by word through the scripture, then we know it's true. We're living in the last days. Amen. So you see, as you're looking at this, when Brother Branham says, I don't know the word real well, but I know the author. Now you could take that and run a million miles and say, well, what need do we have for the Bible? 
What need do we have for the Word of God? Well, we don't need any understanding. We just need to know the author. But here, he says there has to be a foundation to it. You know the author. Well, what if, you're, what if your understanding of the author is that he's three persons or two persons? What if you have a perverted understanding of who he is and you, ha- you have a pantheon of gods? You could say, well, I know the author. I have an experience. I'm sure you have an experience. But it's got to compare word by word through the scriptures. But the other side of that is it's not merely knowing the Bible. You can memorize the Bible. You can even know the doctrine of the message very well. But without that true experience in the soul, not in the spirit, not on the flesh, but on the inside of the inside, that true experience, it will compare word by word through the scripture. The Holy Spirit's not going to lead you different from the scriptures. And so when he's saying, I know the author real well, you don't know the word. What are they saying to Brother Branham? Really, when you think about that, you don't know the author. Brother Branham, you don't know the word very well. You're not educated. You didn't go to seminary. You don't know the Bible and the Greek and the Hebrew like that. But did Brother Branham not know the Bible? He had a good teacher, the angel of the Lord, came to him and showed him word by word through the scripture. It's not that he didn't know the word. He didn't know it according to theology and seminary teaching which just hatches out, it's an incubator. It's just hatching out a bunch of preachers according to their denominational understanding. The best place to get trained for ministry is right in a local church. Sitting under a pastor, feeding on the word, and and starting to preach, and that pastor teaching you and training you and helping you along the way. But we're called by the Holy Spirit, and we're to be led by the Holy Spirit. And we're to be led word by word through the scriptures. Putting on the whole armor of God. You might have enough degrees to plaster that wall with them and still not know God. See, you know God by faith, nothing else. How by faith? What? Faith in his word. That's the only way he recognizes faith. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing the word of God. That's how it comes, by hearing the word of God. Now, when we look at this, we have to understand God has a channel for revealing himself. This isn't some new age religion. We don't just go out to the woods or go to some house uh, and sit there and wait for something to pass through the heavenlies into our brain. Faith comes by hearing you could say, well, I, I prayed and God showed this to me. You have to have, that's great. But where, show me that in the scripture. Show me that in the message of the hour. Amen. See, there's a channel for God to reveal himself through. He doesn't, re, he doesn't reveal himself outside of that channel. That's critical to understand that is how you want to you wanna know God more. How are you going to know God more? Just go to church? Maybe. Maybe. There's, but there's, there should be a continual feeding that we do on the Word. We, ha- we are so blessed. We have recorded messages of a prophet. Uh, what are, are we taking advantage of that? Imagine what your life would look like if you spend every open opportunity listening to Brother Branham. Imagine what your faith would be like. Imagine how encouraged you would be. Imagine the gloom that sometimes follow you, how that would disappear. See, we have a great opportunity to feed on the Word. Read the Bible. How do we get closer to God, Brother Branham? This is the prophet of God being asked this question. Read your Bible and pray. No, I want a really more complicated answer than that. (laughs) Read your Bible and pray. Get alone with God. Today's quote of the day, bless me so much, uh, that, that was posted um, get out, get out in the, into the woods and pray. S- make it a feature of your life that you're seeking after God, that you're finding space. I want to get alone and be with God. I want to go to my room. I want to go here and study. It's not just for the preacher to study. Each of us believers 
needs to study God's word and feed on God's word and go through the message and go through the scriptures. That's how we know him more. Amen. By feeding on him. You, can, you, can, you, you, you can't force that, but you can create an atmosphere where that the spirit of God is pleased to come and build you and strengthen you as you walk with him. So when God created us, when he created Adam and Eve, he had a purpose in mind when he created him. And it was a God-centered purpose. How do you blank this out so that it's not distracting everybody? Top button? Okay, thank you. So when he made Adam and Eve, he had a purpose. I know from our perspective, we see that he, he made us to, in his image and likeness, to be a reflection of him and to take dominion and fill up the earth with his image. But from God's perspective, what did he do? Brother Branham says, for fellowship. He created man to have fellowship. Well, what is that fellowship? That fellowship is actually worship. The reason why we go into all the world and preach the gospel and, and go on do missions is because God isn't being worshipped over there the way he wants to be worshipped. So we go and proclaim the word so that the people will worship him the way that he wants to be worshipped. And the way he wants to be worshipped is he wants to be reflected. And he wants his dominion to go forth through us so that the, the people that are on earth are a reflection of him. And so, and that singing and prayer and preaching and all these things go along with that, but more than anything, he wants that singing and preaching and prayer to become your life, that you're living on a daily basis, and then you're spreading that in your family and to your community and around you. And so the purpose of missions is worship. And the purpose of our life is worship, reflecting that worship back to him. So God, we understand this, God had his very nature within himself attributes. And so these attributes are what he wanted to express to us, both the attributes of who he is, but also the attributes of his seed, his predestinated seed. So he wanted his elected seed to come forth into manifestation, but then he also wanted his predestinated seed to know him by experience. And then in that experience, worship him for all that he is. So his attributes that he has, we're talking about God is love. God is just. God is uh, merciful. God is gracious. God is wrathful. He, he punishes uh, disobedience and sin. And you can go on and on with all the different attributes of God. But he wanted to express those attributes to us. Healer, redeemer, so forth. He wanted to express those attributes to us and then he wanted us to love him and worship him for who he is in expressing those attributes. See, God isn't a dormant God. God isn't just a word that's far off, but God is you experience his work in your life every day. And then as you experience his work and you, and you go through what you go through and worship him, that's where he's glorified in us and through us. And that's why he, create, he, that's why he created you. That's why we're here. That's why there's an earth and there's a universe. And there's everything that there is is so that he could make himself known and you could reflect back your love to him for him making himself known to us. It's not just a simple thing like, well, God created us just for fellowship. He wanted a good buddy, you know. No, it's far beyond that. It's worship, and it's that reflection that comes back and forth, him reflecting to us, us reflecting back to him, and us worshiping him as he moves and works supernaturally in our lives. God created Adam and Eve. Seventh day came and God said I was, he's satisfied. He rested, right? He did what he wanted to accomplish. But it's not as though God just sat back and said, oh, everything's done. 
in that very place where God rested and God said it was very good. God had a purpose that he wants to accomplish with that creation. When he rested, only the beginning phase was done. Now the purpose had to come for- forward. And in that purpose, you know, you notice God could have, when Satan fell, God could have destroyed him altogether and restarted with no devil, with no tempter. But right in this paradise, God put a temptation. The tree of life and the tree of knowledge. How will you reproduce my life? Will you hybrid it or will you follow my way and do it the way I have commanded? And so that was the world that God created for Adam and Eve to be in. Not a world free of temptation. Isn't, this is amazing to think. Paradise. In paradise, God puts a temptation. Even though he said it was very good, the devil was around. <laughs> there was no devil. It wasn't all of a sudden, oh, he's the devil. I'm shocked. What happened? The devil was already fallen. And there he is coming in through that serpent, tempting them. And so God's pur- purpose wasn't merely to say, um, I want this thing to fall and break. It was, it was, will you pass this test? Before every child of God, he puts a test. Right. See? And this is going into what we're talking about. To know him is life. If Adam and Eve pass the test, think about this. If they pass the test, what, ha- what happens next? They continue in paradise. They have dominion. They seek dominion. But then would they f- really fully know God? If we were here today as his predestinated seed without a fall in a perfect paradise, would we know God completely? Think about that for a second. Philippians 3, verse 10. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. And we just, and we pause at that place and we say, Thank you, Lord. I want to know you and the power of your resurrection. And my goodness, we'll preach every sermon we can about the power of his resurrection. Part A of the verse we really like. We want part A, and we're living, and we're craving, and thursting for Philippians 3.10a. (laughs) But what about part B? What about the second part? That I may know him in the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. If Adam and Eve continued and all they knew him was in the power of his creation, they're missing out on half, maybe more, of knowing God. If God could have made a better world, he would have done that. We look at the world today and say, look at the evil, look at the horrible things. You, you, You read about what happened to those poor Jewish people there next to Gaza. And the, the, the unbelievable, incredible evil that people would do that and then be happy and rejoice and celebrate about it and call mom and say, see, I've killed all these people. Now that's evil. Right. Amen. That is, it's horrendous. But I want you to understand, saints, if God could have made a better world to express himself in, he would have done that. But our wise God knows exactly what he is doing. In order to express himself and to express the nature of his attributes, there needed to be evil. To bring out from himself the very best, evil needed to exist. And then go further to bring out the very best from you, his seed, evil needed to exist. 
God will never be able to express the fullness of his nature without evil existing and combating him. You will never be able to express the fullness of the nature that God made you to be without trouble and trials and evil coming into your life. Adam knew him in power. But as I said, even in the Garden of Eden, he had to be tested to come into his full position. He could never enter into his full position without testing. He could speak to creation. It would obey him. That's power. But he was still in the... He wasn't in maturity. He was innocent. He wasn't fully mature. He had to be tested. He failed the test. Adam and Eve failed the test. So when I look at this world, God made, in his wisdom, made the very best world for his attributes to be expressed in. He created an angel that could fall to pride and sin. He created an angel that, and angels that could rebel against him. He created a woman as a byproduct so that she could be deceived. He created a man that would have a desire to redeem his wife and identify with her sin and throw the whole creation under the d- dominion of the devil. He ordained things with precision so that the world would be under the dominion of the devil. Think about that. I say, I say that with the full understanding of the suffering that each of us go through, the, 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 the pain that we feel when we, lo- when, when we lose. I keep saying lose a loved one, but we don't lose them. We know exactly where they are. When we are separated from a loved one, the pain of someone dying early, too soon, we think, in life. The pain of things that seem senseless and meaningless. I don't say this without feeling. I'm not sitting in a philosopher's office without going through the reality of difficulties and trials. I'm saying this, understanding horrible things have happened to me, to you. God made this world to be the way that he intended it to be. It's not out of his control. And the things that you have are going through in your life, they are predestinated trials. God is working something in you because he's going to bring out something in you that he wants to be manifested of himself. If God made a creation that was without evil in it, it would not be the very best creation that it would be. Think about that. This is where it takes faith. You say, well, how can God allow evil? Isn't God responsible for evil? Paul answers that. Who are you, O man, to reply against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, why have you made me thus? That's an answer that simply takes faith. You, you have to have faith. That's, to, to an atheist, that's not an answer. <laughs> you just told him to shut up is what you just told him to do. <laughs> you told him to be quiet and stop asking questions. It's essentially what Paul said. Who are you to reply against God? God makes everything for a purpose. God is good. God is loving. Amen. So even the statement... How can God allow evil? What is evil? Without God, there is no such thing as good and evil. How are you defining what is good and what is bad? There's just things that happen if there is no God. But God placed within us a conscience to discern both good and evil. The people that are out on the street demonstrating and and protesting because they want more evil, you know that that they're doing that because they have a conscience. But what has happened is it's perverted. Now they say evil is good and good is evil. But that still shows the design of God in giving them a conscience because they say this is bad and this is good. They're condemning their own self. That's why we judge everything. You, you know, it's so crazy. You hear from people when you say homosexuality, that's sin. Transgenderism, that's mental disorder and sin. 
And they say, stop, doesn't the Bible say, judge not, lest you be judged? We are living in an age where everyone is judging everybody. And those who are judging you the hardest are saying, using words they don't even believe, to point at you, don't judge. Judge not, lest you be judged. So, the madness of the age, don't judge. Everyone's judging everyone because God put within our heart a conscience to discern between good and evil. This, right now, is God's perfect world. This is God's perfect way. God is going to bring all things to completion, all things to maturity. There's going to be a new heaven and new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. That will be a permanent thing. But right now, we're in a wor- the world that God made. It's evil, and it's going to get worse and worse. And yet, understand, this isn't outside of his purpose. God made this world. This is God's perfect world to express himself into us. And this is God's perfect way to perfect his attributes. And he does that through suffering. The fellowship, we know, we can, we, part of us knowing God more is through the trials and the suffering. It's the fellowship or the participation or the communion of his suffering. We, we suffer in this life. We go through trials and difficulties. And as the, as the hour gets shorter, we'll go through more. <laughs> That's not meant to discourage you. That's meant to give you a prophetic warning. Is that as we approach the rapture, the increase of the, of the enemy's work, he knows his time is short. And he's going to do everything that he can pr- do to prevent God from working in your life and distracting you. Right. But he's actually just playing into God's plan. Amen. How are we made conformable unto his death? That, that, is, that is an end that God is bringing us towards. What was the death of Jesus? We could say that was on the cross. He suffered on the cross. I think it goes further than that, deeper than that, is he, in Gethsemane. He went to Gethsemane and he battled it out with the enemy. If there's any way, Father, that this cup could pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. That's the place that he's trying to bring the bride to in this hour. He's trying to bring us to be conformable to that death. To that death where he died completely to himself and then could go to Calvary and die for our sins and for the redemption of the world. Amen. To know, that I may know him in the fellowship of his sufferings. If we only knew him in his power, we would only know him in part. But when we know him in his power and in suffering, we can know him in fullness. Amen. God never ordained for his saints to live an easy life. We might be comfortable. We're pretty comfortable in North America. But we're not without trials and suffering. And we're not without the enemy coming against us at every hand. If the enemy wasn't coming against us, it means we would be on his side working for him. (laughs) So we face troubles, we face trials because... We are fighting the Lord's battles. We are treading on Satan's kingdom. We are seeking to proclaim and live by an example. This is what men and women and young people are supposed to look like and live like and walk like. Didn't used to be this way. It used to be uh, 200 years ago, men looked like men and women looked like women. And a woman knew her place was in the home. And she knew that her place was to take care of her children and family. And a man knew his responsibility was to take care of his family and to, and to provide for his family and for his children. And, and they had a family altar. And they, they went to church. 
And that's what you do. Amen? That's how God wants us to live. It's spreading his dominion. You think, oh, I'm not doing anything for God. Are you teaching your children to serve God? Are you crying your eyes out in prayer for your teenagers to get an experience with God? You are treading on the devil's ground. The greatest thing you can do, moms and dads, is to get your children in the right atmosphere and get them to the Holy Ghost. And the devil is going to come against you on every hand. And, and he'll, he'll even send things through the church. Difficulties and drama amongst the young people. And what it is, we, we, as, we, as, we should be mature. We should be wise and have an end in sight that the devil is trying to destroy we see that it's a spirit. It's not people. It's a spirit working, and it'll bring, it'll bring all kinds of trials to you, but you're ordained to be an overcomer. You're ordained to have victory. You're ordained to go through that. See, it's not your, it's not your ordained to never have a trial. <laughs> it's your ordained to overcome through a trial. Paul speaks about being pressed above measure uh, so that we despaired even of life. I mean, think about that for a second. That's, that's a trial. That's, a, that's, a, that's pressure. That's suffering. We go through that. That's an important thing. We have to go through that. And, and it hurts. And I've, uh, I've been through many trials. And it seems like Every year before we have youth camp and after we have youth camp, it's about two months of intense suffering <laughs> that takes place. But we know that the, the Lord is, wor- is working in young people's lives and he wants to do everything he can. I mean, he, for our first youth camp we had, I, I almost died of COVID. This youth camp, the devil tried to kill my wife. And you see, this is to be expected. <laughs> Paul, didn't Peter say that? Don't be surprised. Don't be afraid with any amazement at the fiery trial right. you're about to go through. Amen. See, but we're afraid and we get amazed and we're shocked. Why are these trials happening? What am I, what is going on? What's wrong? Something's wrong. Something's out of character. Yeah, there's something wrong. There's a, there's a devil trying to destroy you and you've got to defeat him. Uh, Hebrews Chapter 5. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Think about that. He was perfect. He was sinless. He didn't even have, he didn't even have a sin nature. He was born, though he was in a human body, though that body got old, got sick, yet he didn't have a nature to sin. See, and yet still he had to learn obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect or made complete or made mature, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all that obey him. So we look at these these verses and we see, how, if, if Jesus Christ could not be made perfect without suffering, how in the world are we ever going to come to maturity as the bride? That's what we're living in. That's what the fivefold ministry is sent for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry. Amen. See, how are we going to get there without suffering? God is a healer. God is a supernatural God. I've been delivered so many times. Amen. But it, see, it seems in this hour, the trials that we face, we also see where God chooses not to heal someone and takes them home. Where God chooses to bring someone through something. And I believe it's when God brings us through something, that's where we see real faith. That's where we see a maturing of faith. It's real faith that heals you, but it's also real faith that brings you through. Amen? In the God of this evil age, 
Brother Branham says this. I've got a lengthy quote to read here. Notice, not what someone has said, what someone called, but what God chose before the foundation of the world and is calling these people in the last days, not an organization, a people for his name. And this evil age is when he's doing it, this very age of deception. Now think about this for a minute. I, 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 this isn't lost on me. Every time I look back and see Brother Branham speaking in the 50s and 60s, and he, I see him speaking, and I think it was just child's play back then. It was just in a seed form back then. But when, he's, when, I'm watch, when I listen to him speak, and I read these things, I see... This is the hour we're living in, saints. Amen. We need this, what the prophet is saying, now more than ever because we're living in the fruits of the deceit, deception that he saw. He said last week in Matthew 24, it was the most deceiving age of all ages. All the ages of deceit from the Garden of Eden all the way down, there's never been an age so deceptive as this age. False prophets will rise and show signs and wonders, if possible, deceive the very elected. Now, just a f cold, formal, starchy churches and so forth of man-made theology, that wouldn't deceive the elect. The elect would never pay no attention to that. But it's up there almost like the real thing. Just leaving out one word is all you have to do. Promised of the age, very great time. Christians everywhere, take heed to the hour we're living. Mark down and read and listen close. What would God call a people out of this evil age for his name? The reason it is, is to try her, his bride. When she is made manifest, been tried, been proven, proved to Satan like it was at the beginning, so shall it be at the end. As a seed starts in the ground, it comes up through carriers, the life of it, but it ends up the same seed that it was when it went into the ground. In the same way the seed of deceit fell in the ground in Eden is the same way it ends up in the last days. Just as the gospel was, was when it fell to a denomination at Nicaea, Rome, it ends up in a super organization. Just as the seed of the church fell back there with the signs, wonders, and the living Christ among them, it ends up in the last days under the ministry of Malachi 4 and restores back again the original faith that was once given. We find now this evil age is to prove to Satan she's not like Eve. She's not that type of woman. And she will be tried by his word, the bride, as Adam's bride was tried by the word. And Adam's bride believed every bit of the word, all but confused on one promise, that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Today, see but failed on one promise under the temptation of the enemy face to face. And now the people that's called for his name, of course, is his bride. Amen. Amen. So he will perfect his bride in the most evil and deceptive age. Amen. This is not a mistake. The, the very God that ordained that the bride would come to maturity, would come to perfection by the word in this age, realize she would never come through perfection just by the word being declared over her. Uh-oh, watching out for the rocks. <laughs> he never ordained that it would merely be the word that would perfect the bride, but it had to be in the midst of a deceptive age, because remember, it's not just through the power of the word, that we know him, it's through the fellowship of his sufferings. So he put us in the midst of a deception to do what? To go through trials, to be tested and tried, so that he could do what? Prove to the devil, that you can throw everything you want at this bride. You can throw every deception at her, and she's going to stand the test. It's tried by the word, because that word has to be taken right in the depths of the teeth of the enemy and we have to defeat him face to face so what what does it do satan turns the deception up to 100 out of 100 on the meter right the whole world is under deception think about it saints we as believers who are following just some basic things of christian living 
Men don't wear shorts. Women don't wear pants. Sisters don't cut your hair. Don't wear makeup. This was like ABCs up to 100, 100 years ago. Every Christian did that. Catholics, Baptists, Methodists, Lutherans, everybody did that. In fact, all of society said, what are you doing wearing pants, woman? Get back in your place. That's not right. Put on a dress. Wear a bikini, you're going to jail. That was the politicians that did that. Now we're in an age, you say what I said and the public knows what I said, they would say, what a fanatic. And every Christian church, pretty much, other than a couple, would say, well, that has nothing to do with it. God just looks at our heart. Well, then why did every Christian follow this all through this time? What is the, it's an age of deceit. In the very age that he's going to perfect his bride, Satan perverts the woman completely. And then also brings a feminine spirit over the whole church so that she knows not who her Lord is. God has ordained this evil age to challenge us, to try us, to allow things to become so difficult and impossible for us so that he could manifest himself in the fullness of who he is. Amen. Amen. Think about that for a second, saints. He's manifesting himself through the bride in the fullness of all that he is. But he can never do it unless it's in an age of suffering. And deception. My. Strange preaching. I know. I'm a strange guy. I'm getting excited because they realize there's a purpose. We're not standing here telling you, oh, uh, everything's going to be perfect for you. And as soon as you get sick, God's going to heal you. As soon as you're sick, God can heal you. And he does that. But I'm also, I also understand that sometimes we get sick And we lay in bed. And then what do we do? Oh man, God doesn't love me because he hasn't healed me. And it's it's so hard. And I I struggle probably worse than anybody. When I get sick, I'm the worst complainer. (laughs) I am. And God's going to keep letting me get sick. (laughs) I don't don't want to. But he wants me to overcome this struggle that I have. He wants me to be positive through the difficulties, through the trials. He wants me to see the purpose. It's not fun. It's not easy to live in an age of deception. But God, man, God is known through the power of the resurrection and through the fellowship of sufferings. And so if, you're gonna, if, if he, he's going to manifest himself fully to you so that you know him in fullness, you're, gonna, you're going to go through trials, difficulties, in an age of deception where everyone looks at you and says, madness, these people are crazy. Well, the reality is they're crazy. Amen. Amen. I don't want to go too long, but I have to get through Psalm uh, 139. And all right. Psalm 139, uh, as I study this, I see its connection to Romans 8, 28 through 39. It's just incredible to me as I look at this. And I pray as we go through these scriptures, it's, it's a balm to you. Psalm 139 is your psalm, okay? I want you to understand this, young people, all of us. You see yourself in this because this is God's hand upon you from before you were born. O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down sitting and mine uprising. Thou understandeth my thought afar off. Thou compasseth my path, my lying down, and are acquainted with all my ways. So as we look at this, this isn't merely David saying God is omniscient. 
God is omniscient. God is omnipresent. He knows all things. He sees all things, etc. No, that's not what he, it's, he's not trying to make a theological point. This is David from the depths of his heart seeing who God is to him. God, you, you know when I sit down, you know when I stand up, and you understand my thought afar off. In other words, long before I ever think my thought, you know even what I'm going to think. And, and through all of this, you have searched me. You have known me. And he still loves us. He knows every detail about us. He shaped every detail. He planned every detail. He, he, it says, he, you compasseth my path. See, in other words, he surrounds you. Every, every, every direction. He's surrounding you. But it even goes further than that. He has ordained your path. Every step you take, God has ordained it. Not only ordained it, he's walking it with you. Amen. And my line, when, you, when, I, when, I, when I lie down, you have compassed it. My path that I'm walking on, you've compassed that also. And you're comp- acquainted with all my ways. In things that are to be, Brother Branham says, your birth here was pre-planned. I guess you believe that. Every one of you knows that our birth was pre-planned. Did you know that your being here never originated just at a myth or a thought? Everything, this is one of my favorite quotes in all the message, everything was all pre-planned by God before the foundation of the world, that you would be here. Even to the detail of you being here right now was planned by God before the world ever was started. The infinite God knowed, and to be infinite, he had to know every flea that ever would be in the earth, and how many times it would bat its eye. That's infinite, see? Our little minds cannot fathom what infinite means. The infinite God, he knowed all things. For there's not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it all together. Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thy hand upon me. Think about that. This, this is, I want you to feel this. I want you to get the emotion of this because when you're, when you're going through a trial, you don't feel that. But I want you to realize this is when you're in your darkest moment. He's beset you behind and before And not only he's in front of you and behind you, he's put his hand on you. His hand is there, see? So don't think you're alone. In the times that you think you're alone, that's when he's with you the most. And that has to be a revelation to you. And then what what he says, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's high. I cannot attain that. See, that's more than just a knowledge, a doctrine, a doctrinal knowledge. This is something that you say that you're just in amazement when you see the reality of God's sovereignty and God's hand in your life. See, we can look back and see that in our lives, yeah? You can look back and say, amen, you've done that. But what about in the middle of hurting? Can we, can we realize even in that time, he's been with you and he's, he's compassed your path. He's ordained the path that you've, you're to walk on. He's in front of you and behind you and his hand is on you. That's what knowledge is too. It's amazing. I cannot attain it. It's never, it will never attain that. Whither shall I go from thy spirit or whither shall I flee from thy Presence. This is amazing because you realize that as you look at this, why would you even say that? <laughs> You're in the midst of a trial. You're in the midst of something so difficult and so hard, and you say, I just want to get, I just want to run away. I want to get out of here. I don't want to deal with this anymore. And you say, I'm going to run away from God's Spirit. If you're predestinated seed, you may have felt that. I've felt that. 
Where am I, wh- but in, when it comes to revelation, where am I going to go from his spirit? Amen. Where will I flee from your presence? If I ascend up to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou out there. You say, that's a strange statement. For the predestinated seed, you're not getting away from God. <laughs> Even if you go down into the grave, God is there. If you go down in the depths of the earth, if you go to the bottom of the ocean, Jonah will tell you, God is there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost part of the sea. When I read that, I always think of Jonah. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come come up before me. So to get to Nineveh, you need to take a caravan, and there's specific roads that will take you through Galilee and through the Valley of Megiddo into Jordan, Syria, and to Iraq. So Jonah gets his plan (laughs) and does not do that. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa. So he goes to Tel Aviv. <laughs> That's Joppa and Tel Aviv. It's the same place. I've been there. And it's a, a port city. And so instead of, you cannot, I'm sorry, as hard as you try, you cannot get on a ship and get to Nineveh. It's in the middle of the desert. It's on a river, but it's in the middle of the desert. So you found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the, from the presence of the Lord. Whither shall I f- flee from thy spirit? Jonah's trying to flee from God's spirit. Then we fast forward and see, then were the men exceedingly afraid and said unto him, Why have you done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. And where does Jonah end up? At the uttermost parts of the sea. What does he find out? He's not getting away from God. He's not running away from God. He's not even running away from what God told him to do. God creates a fish, gets him in, gets him in that fish. How did he survive? No idea. Supernatural. Because there's, you can't. And God, did God raise him from the dead? Did God supernaturally give him oxygen in his lungs? We don't know. We just know that Jonah survived something that's not survivable. And here he is, and God uses that to bring him to the place that worships the fish god. And so even Jonah's, Brother Branham says Jonah wasn't getting away from God. (laughs) See, he, he was, but he wasn't. He says he was running from the presence of the Lord, but the reality is God had ordained Jonah's steps. Why? Because there was going to be God in flesh, the Messiah, that would come and say, just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. And so God had ordained this whole thing that Jonah had done. Yes, Jonah was thought he was running from the presence of the Lord, but he was just doing exactly what God had ordained for him to do. Because God knew what kind of person Jonah was. God knew that Jonah hated the Ninevites. God knew that all Israelites hated the Ninevites. And the last thing that they wanted was repentance and deliverance. They wanted that country destroyed because everyone feared them. And everyone hated those Ninevites. They were evil. They were, they were, they were Hamas. <laughs> That's the kind of bloodthirsty, evil people that the Ninevites were. But God had a different plan. And God sent him into the ocean and then sent him back to Nineveh. That was God. He ordained that. He was with Jonah every step of the way. And even when Jonah's attitude was bad, it was rotten. Oh, why do these people repent? I knew that you would do that. That's why I ran away from you. I knew you would have mercy. If I called them to repent and they repented, you'd have mercy and wouldn't destroy them. And even if they, after they repented, he had a revival, he made an altar call, everyone came to the altar. Even their animals came to the altar and repented. And he goes out of the city and watches over and says, well, maybe God will destroy it anyhow. 
and he's depressed and angry and says, God, kill me. Still, God didn't abandon him. Saints of God, do you know at your worst moment, at your worst time, at your place of total, you're, you're thinking thoughts of unbelief. Don't tell me you haven't. <laughs> Don't tell me you, Satan hasn't gotten you all twisted up and you think, I'm just going to run away. Don't tell me you haven't because you have, because I have. In those darkest moments, God is with you. God will not, has not abandoned you. He's not left you. He is there. Even there, thy hand shall lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. In those moments where you think, I'm running from God, in those moments where you feel, he doesn't love me, his right hand has led you there. You think, how can that be? I did a horrible thing. I did this. You did. Repent. (laughs) But he's there with you. He's not left you. Think of Hosea and his wife. That's a story of God's love. She was as rotten as could be. She betrayed him over and over again. And God kept saying, go back. Go back and take her. Go back and bring her back. Why? That's his love. That's God's love for you. He's not going to lose his predestinated seed. He's not going to abandon you to unbelief. He is going to chase you down, and he's going to be with you every step of the way. And when it's uncomfortable and when it hurts, he's there. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me. My goodness, what a mind would think this. Surely the darkness, the evil will cover me. Even the night will be light about me. My goodness. Yea, the darkness hides not from thee, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to God. You're not going to run away from him. Just take Jonah. Remember Jonah as an example. If you're his seed, he's going to go to the bottom of the ocean for you. And he's going to supernaturally preserve your life. For thou hast possessed my reins. Thou hast covered me in my mother's wombs. It's, it's, the, the reins speaks of the heart. It's actually the, the kidneys. <laughs> You're dwelling in my kidneys is what it's actually saying. What, it, what it's speaking of is you, you, you hold my heart. You know everything about it, and you've ordained everything that my heart goes through. You have covered me in my mother's womb. From the very beginning, when the sperm and the egg come together, God has been there fashioning you. You're not a mistake. You're not an error. You're not the result of this is just what biological processes do. No. If you're predestinated seed of God... He was there shaping and fashioning you so that you would be exactly the way you are. You say, I I don't feel this. I'm fat. I'm too skinny. Uh, I got too many pimples. I got too many freckles. I I look weird. God has ordained everything about you, and he's done it because of love and because he has a purpose. And you don't have to be ashamed of yourself. Unless you have sinned, then be ashamed of yourself and repent and stand up and know that he's formed you. I will praise thee for I am fearfully, reverently, and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. What works are so marvelous? Me. (laughs) David is speaking about himself. So put, put your name in there. I could say... Brother Jason DeMars is a marvelous work of God. It feels strange to say that in public, but that's for you. You are a marvelous work of God. The question is, but does does your soul know that right? Well, it should. The devil tells you the opposite all the time. But the fact is, you are a marvelous work. God, think about that. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. So who is the one that made you? 
So God himself made you with great reverence and wonder in his mind and in his heart. Think about that for a second. Let that soak down to your soul when you're discouraged about yourself is God made you. And God himself, when he made you, was reverent and looked at you with wonder. (laughs) It's amazing. Let your soul know that right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth because he was there doing it. He was there shaping you, making sure you turned out exactly what he had in his mind before the foundation of the world. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which is in continuance, were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. He's seen everything about you. He knows everything about you. He knows every thought that you think before you think it. He knows every step that you take before, not only because he knows it, but he's actually ordained it. He knows every trial that you're going through. He knows every heartache that you face. And he's fashioning it and shaping it to make you be that expression of him that he's ordained before the foundation of the world. And we're not waiting off until the new earth, until we become that expression, but he wants you to become that expression in this very evil and wicked age. He wants you to be his expression now. And he will take you through trials. And he'll take you through things you say, I made a horrible mistake when that happened. And yet he's going to reveal himself to you and in you and through you through that mistake that you made. And you're going to see his hand more in your life. And you're going to have a greater desire to worship him even through the stupid stuff you did. Think about that for a minute. Yes, we have to repent. Yes, it's sometimes we sin horribly. Jonah sinned. Let's make no mistake about it. He sinned and he had a bad attitude about it. And still God never abandoned him. Don't think, I made a mistake, God has abandoned me. Okay, his influence might be back for a moment. But he has not left you. What does it mean, I will never leave you or forsake you? Did he leave and forsake Peter? Peter denied him three times. Jesus went after him anyway. Don't forget that. And when you see other people making mistakes and doing stupid stuff, remember that God loves them like that too. And you be the hands of the Holy Spirit to go after them. From the Church Ages book, I'm, I'm trying to close. Forgive me for going long. Thus, the thoughts of God are eternal. They are real. They're not simply like a man with a blueprint he's drawn up and which one day will be translated into substance and form, but they're already real and eternal and a part of God. See how this works. God always had his thoughts for Adam. Adam, as his thoughts, was yet unexpressed. Psalm 139, 15, and 16 will give you a little idea of this, that, as I said, was not written about Adam, but it gives you idea and knowledge that the thought was there in his mind, and that thought was eternal and had to be expressed. So when Adam was formed of the dust of the earth and his spiritual being created by God, then Adam became God's thought expressed, and those eternal thoughts were now manifested. Psalm 139, 17, How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them. How precious are thy thoughts. This isn't merely God's thoughts that are written in the Word and in the Bible. But these are the thoughts that God has about you as an individual. How precious are thy thoughts towards me, 
unto me, towards me, O God. How great is the sum of them. How great is the sum of them. Let's look at the next verse. If I should count them, count them what? Count the, God's thoughts towards you. They're more in number than the sand. Think about that. Come, come visit us in Beaufort. We'll take you out to Hunting Island. Then we'll go there and start counting the grains of sand together. <laughs> you can't. It's impossible. Just a handful is more than we can count. So think about that. More than the sand at, a, at the ocean. That's the thoughts. That's the amount of thoughts that God has towards you as an individual. Well, I'm not this. I'm just this. I'm just... Nonsense. Stop listening to the devil. Listen, listen to what I'm telling you for a second. God's thoughts towards you are more than the, sa- the grains of sand at the seashore. Amen. When I awake, I'm still with thee. He's still there. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. M- musicians, if you'd come. Romans 8. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. So we see the sovereignty of God in his plan of salvation and in, in what he's going to do for you. He's going to bring you to the place where you have a body just like Jesus' glorified body that he has now. That's his purpose. He's bringing us to that. He'll bring us through whatever he needs to to bring us to that. I'm going to skip this quote. Let's go directly back to Romans 8.31. What shall we say what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? So this is like Paul saying, okay, we've presented this doctrine to you, this teaching to you. Now, what should we say to it? How should we think about it? How does this apply in our lives? If God is for us, see, he's predestinated us to be conformed to the image. So if that's the case... If God is for us, then who can be against us? So he's going to ask us a series of questions. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justifies. In other words, it's God that declares you perfect, sinless, spotless bride of Christ that you've never even sinned in the first place. Not because of your works, but because of what he's declared, because of the blood of his son. Who is he that condemns? It's Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who's even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. So who is he that condemns us? Who stands against us? Who comes against us? I mean, a lot of things come against us. A lot of people come against us. A lot of devils come against us. But they can't do it. Because why? Because it is God that's justified. It's not Angel Gabriel that's justified us. It's not the Apostle Paul or your pastor that's justified you. It's God that's justified you. And it's Christ that's interceding for you. So who's going to come against you? Who is going to condemn you? No one can do it. They will do it. They'll try. This is just as what Paul's going to say in these next few verses. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? In other words, there are forces, there are spirits, there are people trying to separate us from the love of Christ. But who can do it effectively? Who can really accomplish it? Shall tribulation? Tribulation's trying to separate us from the love of Christ. But can it? Distress. It's trying to separate us. Persecution. Famine. Nakedness. Peril. Sword. I thought we were just living our best life now, Brother Chris. 
I thought we were promised houses and lands. We are, but not for right now. We'll get that in the millennium and the new earth. Now we're promised that through much tribulation, you'll enter the kingdom. So there's going to be tribulation, there's going to be stress, there's going to be persecution, there's going to be famine, there's going to be, oh my goodness, nakedness. You say, my circumstances are not that bad. They could be. They could be. Believers have experienced this where, and it's not they're walking around naked. No, it's that they don't have adequate clothing for the weather that's about them. Paul, that, even Paul himself writes and says, please, I left my coat here. Would you bring that for me? Paul himself experienced this. Or peril, or sword. These are things that we as Christians in the line of duty will face. But none of them will separate us from the love of Christ. Amen. As it is written, for thy sake we're killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. How many have that written on your refrigerator? <laughs> on a magnet? You probably don't. But it's the truth nevertheless. Right. Satan is hunting us. Satan is trying to devour us like a roaring lion. We're going to be in people's eyes, my goodness, and sometimes we feel like we're accounted as sheep for the slaughter. But guess what God says? Nay, he says, no. <laughs> we might be accounted as sheep for the slaughter. We might face all these difficulties. But Paul says, no. In all these things, not, it's not even saying that we're delivered out of going through these things. But he says, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Amen. How are we more than conquerors? Because you're so strong and powerful. No, through him that loved us because of what he did for us and what he's doing in us. So we might face, as the scripture says, tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword. Does that mean God has abandoned you? Does that mean God doesn't love you? That, does that mean that you aren't under the blessing of God? See, these things are, are difficult for the human mind. You can sit here when you're comfortable and you're wearing your nice clothes and say amen, but what about when you're sick? What about you're under the attack of the enemy? What about when people are speaking against you? Can you realize that in all these things you are more than a conqueror? Amen. Through him that loved you. He that began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. For I am persuaded. So Paul, looking at all of this, looking at all of his trials. Remember, Paul didn't get this out of the Talmud. <laughs> he didn't get this out of some pre-written book that he's basing it off of. This is Paul's revelation. And this is Paul's experiential knowledge of God himself. This is knowing God. Saints, can I tell you that? This is knowing God. It's through the trials, through the difficulties, through the pain, through the suffering, through the horrible things that we pass through, through not, not being able to pay the bills, through getting kicked out of your house. Oh, boy, that brother, he just doesn't have God's blessing. Wrong. False. God's taking him through something. We look at it and say, well, if you follow God's principles, everything would be fine. Sometimes God lets us fall and look like we've failed in order to take us through something for his glory. And it doesn't separate us from his love. What does he say? I'm not, I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's no trial. There's no sin that you, that you face. If you're a born-again Holy Ghost believer, you will sin. You will make stupid mistakes. You will say things that are wrong. 
none of it separates you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Because you as a predestinated seed, that Holy Spirit will convict your heart and you'll say, I'm sorry. I, I, I sinned. God, forgive me. You'll make it right. But nothing will separate you from his love. You might, lose, you might have your car repossessed. You might have your home taken out from you. You might be homeless on the street. And everybody's going to look at you and say, see, he's, I knew he was horrible. I knew he was a bad guy. I knew he was a failure. Even those things, to us North Americans who think this is the epitome of defeat, is not defeat. If that person is walking with God, they could go through the worst trials, lose everything. Did God stop loving Job? No, we realize this because we read the Bible and see that it was actually God's love to prove Job and prove himself through Job. And yet he lost his kids, he lost his home, lost his everything. His wife turned against him. Realize that that doesn't mean you're abandoned. That doesn't mean that God is against you. If you love God, God has placed that love in your heart for him. And his hand is on your life. Know that he is with you and that outward blessings have nothing to do with the true love of God. I don't know how else to read that. Maybe you read it a different way. Maybe I've made a mistake. But as I look at these things, I wish he wouldn't say that, but it's, it's nakedness, peril, sword, famine. You can read church history. You can understand. The horrible things that people have gone through doesn't mean that God hated them or God had turned against them or God had abandoned him. God was showing something different maybe that none of us can understand. But he was showing something. He was showing a reality and he was working out something in their lives. Sometimes he takes things away from us because we're putting our trust in that instead of putting our trust in him. And he knows what's, what's best. And he knows, that he knows how to make us into the bride of Jesus Christ that he wants us to be. He knows how to change our nature and make it like the Lord Jesus' nature. And that's the, that's the ultimate reality of what God is trying to do. Going back to the, what I was laying at the beginning is he wants us to worship him. But that's so simple. You think we can just make a cathedral and Worship the God of heaven. No. Real worship is he's expressing his attributes to you, his attribute, so that you, his attribute, would then reflect back his attributes to him for his glory and that the world would see it and say, I want to reflect that same ba thing back to my heavenly father. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just come to you, Lord. I just pray for every believer here and everyone that's been under the sound of, of your voice, Lord, that they would be encouraged and strengthened, Lord, and that each one would catch the revelation, Lord. No doubt there's, it's through the foolishness of preaching, Lord, and, and the weakness of the vessels and, and, and those of us that we're not immune from struggling and from trials and from mistakes, Lord, but it's through the midst of that that you're working and that you're changing lives and that you're transforming people. Lord, we thank you for that. We pray, Father, that you'd bring healing and bring deliverance, Lord. More than anything, I pray that, that each one would feel your purpose for themselves a little bit more, that they would have a greater understanding of knowing you in the power of your resurrection and the fellowship of your sufferings, Lord. We thank you and we give you glory in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Christ. Thank you for listening to Equipping the Bride podcast. New episodes are posted every Friday. I want to remind you that if you have any questions, testimonies, or prayer requests, please let me know 
at jasondemars.com. I also have free books and tracks available at my website, and shipping is free as well. Please, I ask you to remember the believers and the mission's work in the Middle East in prayer. May the Lord richly bless you.